Moving forward. I want to talk about mobile publics, and when you think about publics, you tend to think about the Greek agora, um, big political decisions, or also um, the imagined communities that Bene Benedict Anderson talks about. You know, the, all the newspaper readers reading the newspaper and the news at eight o'clock in the morning and sharing this imagined community. Um, but as the relationship between physical and virtual spaces is changing, what's possible in terms of forming publics is also changing. And uh, Mimi Scheller is one of the people who first talked about this, um, talking about how the convergence of physical and virtual spaces is actually making it possible for momentary gelling of publics across different social spaces and scales, even globally. And that's something that's very interesting. And it's important to think about it in terms of not so much as something driven by technology or some other mysterious mechanism. It's actually something that's being brought into reality through the ways in which increasing numbers of us are living mobile lives. So the way in which we move around actually makes and transforms societies, environments. It also enacts what it means to be human differently. Um, and I'm going to talk about um, some examples um, of implications of that. For example, move from democracy to demodynamics, um, possibly. Um, and I'm also going to talk about some possibilities that we are, um, as scholars, generating from this. You know, what can we do about it? What, how can we amplify the positive aspects of this and maybe control the less desirable ones? And to get us into the mood of what public space is, I'd like to take us back um, to the 1970s, when William White, an urban planner and architect, was very concerned about what was happening to public spaces. Because at the time there was a policy um, that stipulated that every office building, when they put it up, they also had to build a civic plaza. But when he looked at those open public spaces, they were all empty. He was trying to understand why, in comparison, in comparison many other spaces um, actually worked. So he tried to study how, what makes a public space successful. Um, and he used pioneered mobile methods in, in some respects, putting cameras on top of high-rise um, high buildings studying how people were moving around in public spaces and also using cameras on the ground following how people were moving around. What you see there is so socialities being enacted um, in um, very mobile ways. So people are actually moving around and this is um, a, a very different kind of sociality of how, how these spaces are inhabited. So what you see there are lots of uh, chance encounters enacted through the ways in which people are moving around each other and how they actually stand right in the middle of the flow and, um, uh, and there, thereby um, interact with each other. Irving Guffman in his studies of behaviour in public spaces makes a very good analysis of um, how this happens and also what this does to the social order that's being enacted there. So if you are co-present and people are moving around and you um, actually look each other into the eye potentially, you have what he calls involvement obligations and you might escape these by using a book on a tube. Or, um, but there are um, very strong obligations to at least at a minimal level engage with other people. And this has an effect on how social order, what kinds of social orders are being produced. If you compare that with today, you see that um, people are not just co-present, but also enacting um, what um, scholars like Christian Lee Kopp and Jen, Jen Southern, um, Ole Jensen talk about in terms of co-mobilities, mobile widths, um, absent presences, present absences. And the question is, 
what kind of publics are being enacted when people are hiding behind their mobile technologies? Um, and that's quite an important question because um, if you have involvement obligations and people engage with each other at this minimal level, you, you create societies that um, have a human dimension and um, um, arrange themselves around diversity and in interact with each other. People need co-presence to know what's really going on. What's happening when we are um, connected through absent presences, co-presences, creating all these different layers of um, connectivity. Um, and people talk about negative implications like very shallow, intimate communities, people connected through a sort of constant ticking over of how are you all right, I'm all right, are you okay, hello, good morning, and things like that. Um, very shallow, full-time, intimate communities, but what is the intimacy there and what is the connection? Um, other people like um, Baumann talk about the actual erosion of the possibility for capital P politics because the everyday politics of engaging with each other doesn't really connect um, people anymore and doesn't allow them to connect to big political themes. Another dimension or complication implication of mobile publics is how we are connected um, through all those mobile technologies means that we are also connected to huge data stores that map and track every movement, every communication. And it could be that we are actually um, trading the ability to connect with others um, through a Faustian bargain with um, uh, where we actually lose the ability to negotiate privacy and the sophisticated ways that we are able to do now and that has implications for the kind of civil liberties and the freedoms that we have enjoyed over the last um, hundred years or so. One of the things that we're particularly interested he in uh, here in the Mobilities Lab is the question of whether the new mobile publics are inherently more altruistic, cosmopolitan than the kind of traditional publics that um, we think about. Um, and I'd like to give you an example, and I'm going to give you several examples now, um, of what um, mobile publics might be. Um, this is a story of uh, the Copenhagen Wheel, where designers um, created a bicycle that um, actually collects um, environmental data about the air pollution, about the uh, quality of the cycle paths and uh, the, the level of traffic. And people, as they cycle, um, collect this data. So they become, in a way, um, citizen sensors for environmental moni monitoring. And the kind of data that they generate um, actually can inform political decisions about um, how to route the traffic, how to perhaps um, introduce congestion charges or where to put cycle paths and um, things like that. So what you've got there is an example of collective intelligence, both in the sense of people generating insight and understanding of the traffic network, transport network in, in their city, Copenhagen, and uh, a gathering of collective intelligence, sensor data, real data about about these issues. And you see some visualizations of how that data can be brought together to inform political decisions. Quite an interesting example. And people talk about this in terms of smart mobs, and it's quite a positive um, uh, development. You can have these kind of publics, not just uh, using censors, but also just using um, Twitter or Facebook to come around political issues and generate a force that can influence uh, policy making. Um, and Axel Bruns talks about this in terms of demo dynamics, that we're actually moving from democratic um, deliberation towards people 
um, monitoring the information field and noticing when something relevant to their community comes up and then getting behind the cause um, and being quite fluid about this. In some respects, um, this kind of dynamic um, formation of mobile publics is very powerful, but, um, and Michael Schutzen talks about it in terms of monitorial citizenship, so rather than the informed citizen, you have the monitorial citizen who um, monitors the in information field and then gets behind experts uh, and behind particular issues, which can actually be more demanding than um, uh, the more informed citizenship that we had before. So the kind of monitorial um, citizenship can be more demanding than the more informed citizenship of Ben Anderson's imagined communities. So there's another dimension to this which um, is potentially quite problematic because with all the dynamism and the fluidity of people getting behind the cause, um, Jody Dean, um, a, a journalist and scholar, um, argues that it's actually much more about um, putting out messages, circulating messages, forwarding messages from especially celebrities and powerful people to en enhance your own social and network capital. I was looking for an example of that and um, I don't know if you know the story behind this picture. In 2006 in Belarus, um, flash mobs formed of young people protesting against the oppressive um, dictatorial regime and they were very careful um, and just organized around um, eating ice cream in a public square and they did that in large numbers and they were arrested for eating ice cream in a sunny public square and the pictures of that went all around the world and generated a huge amount of interest and outrage in relation to this oppressive regime. And that was in 2006. Well, on the 23rd of September, I think, um, Lukashenko was re-elected. And that message was retweeted twice, once by the law map and once by myself. So obviously, the public, the crowd, has moved on interest. They've lost interest in this cause. So. Um, it seems to me that there's something quite interesting going on around the notion of communicative capitalism and it may, being more about the circulation of messages than actual engagement, actual action. To draw things together, I'd like to go a bit deeper into that actually, um, where to, by drawing a comparison with um, alternate reality games where masses, thousands, hundreds of thousands of people mobilize to um, solve puzzles, complicated things. And it's a very interesting example of collective intelligence. And Jane McGonigal, one of the designers of a very, very famous alternate reality game called I Love Bees, um, reflects on the experience and she says free will has long been assumed to be a core and constant experiential aspect of the gaming experience. But the rise of the puppet master in pervasive gaming suggests that in the new computing landscape, many gamers want to experience precisely the opposite, namely to be orchestrated and to be guided. And I think that um, the way in which publics gather around issues. There is a lot of this kind of orchestration going on and we really don't quite understand how people lead in these um, debates and that's a very important issue to study. And Mark Deutzer says it very well that it is a mess at the moment and we need to study the practices um, of how these mobile publics gather and disperse um, in more detail, and that's where I would like to finish.